Well, hello to everyone and welcome back to my YouTube channel, Health by Heather Hirsch, where here we discuss all things menopause and midlife. Today, I wanted to talk about progesterone. I actually did this over on my Instagram. I got so many comments and questions and in my DMs that I thought, let's turn this also into a YouTube channel video. So that's what we're gonna be talking about today. If you guys don't already follow me over on Instagram, it's a, certainly a fun time. I'm at hormone.health.doc and I'm on Twitter at Heather Hirsch MD. You can also check out my podcast, Women's Health by Heather Hirsch, and I will link that in the description bar below, including my course and my ebook and just tons of resources on all things menopause really good evidence-based information. And that is the whole reason. Actually, I dedicated my entire career to midlife and menopause is because women are led so astray during this time. But also I wanna make sure that you know you are doing things safely and that you're living your best life at the same time. So let's talk about progesterone. So I use progesterone a lot when I am prescribing postmenopausal hormone therapy. Now, you must take progesterone if you have an intact uterus. That is numero uno because the main role of the progesterone component is to prevent precancer in your uterus or uterine cancer. That is its main, main role. And it is one of the big reasons I strongly recommend FDA only approved hormone therapy because it has been scientifically studied to perfectly balance the estrogen that you are taking so that you will not wind up with uterine precancer or cancer. It is such a huge statement to make, but that is the main reason you want to take FDA approved hormone therapy. It has been scientifically studied unlike non-FDA approved or compounded medications, which really should only be used quite sparingly, or in the case that there are severe, severe, severe reactions or allergies to almost everything that is commercially available. And even then, I still worry a little bit and I do follow my patients up with routine ultrasound. Okay, so you need progesterone if you have an intact uterus. What if you don't have an intact uterus? Well, you don't need to take progesterone. Yep, I said it. A lot of people messaged me and said, I don't have a uterus and do I really need to take progesterone? You don't. There are some small benefits from progesterone that we're going to get into, but otherwise you really do not need to take a progestin. Now I want to walk backwards. When we talk about the safety of a postmenopausal hormone therapy, the big study that we know of is called the Women's Health Initiative. And that study came out in the early 2000s. Now I did a whole video on that, which I will link as well, and all about what we've learned from Women's Health Initiative. But the big thing that we learned is that unopposed estrogen, i.e. estrogen alone, can increase your risk substantially for uterine cancer. And so you must take a progesterone if you have an intact uterus and you're also taking estrogen. They then took that uh, and they broke the women up into two arms, women who had um, an, 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 a hysterectomy and they did not have an intact uterus, so they only took estrogen, and women with an intact uterus who they gave estrogen and progesterone. Now, namely, these medications were Primpro or conjugated equine estrogen and uh, Primpro and MPA or conjugated equine estrogen and medoxyprogesterone acetate. And those just make a little bit of a difference. It was an oral combination because that is certainly not the only way that you can take postmenopause hormone therapy. But in the long-term analyses of these, they found that the women who did particularly well were those who, who had had a hysterectomy and were taking estrogen alone. In fact, those women had substantially uh, re, uh, statistically significant reductions in breast cancer and did extremely well. And actually, so did the women in the estrogen progesterone arm, but there was a slight increased risk in breast cancer which actually turns out to be two to four women in a thousand over five years who took oral Prempro. And again, there's different progesterones that we have now. And so what that all sort of means is for those of us who are menopause experts, hmm, 
So the women who took estrogen only had less breast cancer, but those who took estrogen plus progesterone had a slight increased risk. So maybe it's not the estrogen, maybe it's the progesterone component. There's still a lot that we are learning about different types of progestins. Now, when they um, have studied different types of progestins, not the medoxyprogesterone acetate that was used in the WHI, they do even see lower risks of um, uh, breast cancer. So there's a lot to the story. But the reason I go through all of that is because if you do not have an intake to uterus, you don't need to take progesterone, and that might even be better for you. Now, if you have an intact uterus, you must take a progestin. It's just that simple because we do not want you to get uterine cancer, and we know that risk is elevated without balancing the estrogen. Now, all the good stuff really comes from the estrogen replacement, the reduction in vasomotor symptoms, ability to go back to sleep or sleeping issues, mood issues, vaginal atrophy or genital urinary syndrome of menopause, um, bone health, brain heart, health, heart health, especially if you're within 10 years of menopause, significantly improve with the estrogen. So the good stuff kind of comes from the estrogen. The progesterone is really there to protect your intact uterus. There's a couple different ways that you can take take progesterone. My favorite way, actually there's there's a few actually, is to take micronized natural progesterone at a bedtime and that has a little added benefit of sometimes causing some sleepiness so that if you have trouble falling asleep during midlife and menopause, that certainly is a good reason to add that progesterone at bedtime. And some women love this side effect because if they have trouble falling asleep, this makes a huge impact in their ability to get a good night's rest. That's pretty much its other main benefit. So uh, the other ways I like to use progestin is in a progesterone releasing IUD because that kind of progestin really doesn't go systemically. It mainly has effects right in the uterus, right where you need it. So that is one of my other preferred methods. And progestins also come in um, a combination tabs with estrogen. So sometimes it's norethindrone, sometimes it's not natural progesterone, um, sometimes the patches have levonorgestrel. Those are all different types of progestins that one can use. And those actually are a little bit, have even lower rates of breast cancer than um, the medoxyprogesterone acetate, which again, overall was so, was really actually quite low. And it's a complex story, especially when you're thinking about all the different ways and types and kinds of progestins that you can do. So for my patients who do not have an intact uterus, I don't routinely give them progestin unless they find that there is some little benefit from taking that progesterone at nighttime, i.e. falling asleep. That's really the other main reason to use a progestin. Sometimes I also, if my patients have had severe endometriosis and they're early in their um, menopause, it's sort of the early menopause, the first part of that transition, I don't want the estrogen to cause cyclic pain reminiscent of their endometriosis, so I might give them a progesterone even though they have had their uterus removed. There may still be some endometrial implants in the pelvic bowl. Also, if my patients have had really early um, uterine cancers but now have had a hysterectomy and no signs of metastases and their GYN oncologist is okay with using estrogen in menopause, I might also give them a progestin just because they had that diagnosis and I just want to give a little bit of extra protection in the pelvic bowl. And as long as my patients can tolerate it, then those are two other kind of rare reasons I'll use progesterone in a patient who's had a hysterectomy. All right, so say you still have your intact uterus, you guys are still good friends, you need to take that progesterone. There's actually two ways you can do this if you're doing it in a separate pill from your estrogen. I know, just to add another layer, <laughs> and this is a good reason to have a menopause expert or specialist if you have one. So there's two ways to take that separate progesterone. You can take it cyclically, meaning just 12 days of the month, or you can take it continuously, meaning every single night. So why do one or the other? Well, there's definitely some reasons. Some of it is science, some of it is art. So if, if you, you know, let's go with continuous. 
some of the main reasons my patients will take continuous is because it does help them with that benefit of feeling sleepy before bed and helps them with sleep that is just a miracle and so why not if it, they benefit and they notice a difference without it it certainly makes more sense to take it every single night some of my patients also find that they simply go bonkers trying to remember if it's day one through 12 of the calendar month or if they've taken it 12 days and it really messes them up and it just kind of makes them worried and anxious that they're going to forget it so for those patients they just prefer taking it every single night it's kind of just a no-brainer they brush their teeth they take their estrogen they take their progesterone or what have you and boom they're off and running so why do my patients do it cyclically well there is a couple reasons the biggest one is actually for my patients who are in very late perimenopause, early menopause transition. And I know this by your period history, maybe some of your lab work and your symptomatology. But for those patients, when I'm using postmenopausal estrogen, it is a very likely that they are still going to have a bleed or a period. Yes, I know. And it's also more likely that they'll know when they're going to get it if I use the progesterone in a cyclic manner. Typically, I do that days 1 through 12 of the calendar month. And then typically, as that progesterone withdraws, usually on day 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, they will get a bleed. Or they won't, but it's usually, if it's going to come, going to be at that time. That also helps me know yes i was expecting that type of bleeding or you know it just really kind of can help from the clinician standpoint as well as for the patient so to know when you might have your period can certainly make a big difference so that's reason number one the other reason is that just women prefer to have less ex less exposure to the progestin and that's fine again a lot of that might go back to what they feel about the women's health study. Now, again, those were different progesterones, right? Micronized natural progesterone versus MPR, medroxy progesterone acetate. But still, some women like the idea of having less exposure, so they only take it 12 days of the month. And if I forgot to mention, that is the minimum amount of progesterone needed to keep the uterus healthy. Yeah. I have heard some or sometimes I will see progesterone given once every three months, but I still prefer the lowest dose to be at least 12 days of the month. That's kind of mimicking what your body kind of did premenopausally. And studies have shown that that dose, that um, at least 12 days of the month, is going to keep the uterus nice and healthy. So if you're taking an oral separate progesterone, you can do it cyclic which is days one through 12 or continuous every single night. Now you obviously can't do that if your estrogen and progesterone are combined. And again, a lot of this has to do with patient preference, the way that they live their lives, their top symptoms, and my brain kind of beep bop boops tries to figure out what is going to be the best regimen for my patients. So that is a lot about progesterone and certainly I did that in a very quick uh, episode here but I wanted to s help break this mystery of the progesterone down for you before I go let's not gloss over the most important point which is the um, use of FDA approved uh, progesterones now there are plenty of people who do get compounded when you are taking a compounded medication each dose can be very different and each the combinations of medications can be different they can't be studied in large term studies because it's not the same medication in every single batch that's why it's unregulated and that's why and that is why or it is compounded and that makes me worry I have seen many cases of uterine cancer from compounded non-FDA approved progesterone to the point where I certainly really, really encourage my patients to almost always use FDA approved progesterone products. I know this is a point of controversy, especially here on YouTube, and that's okay. My position will always be that. And again, there is extremely, extremely, extremely rare cases 
when it is okay to compound progesterone. A severe allergy to almost everything commercially available or if you're not taking an estrogen. Yeah, if you're taking just progesterone but no estrogen postmenopausally, which, you know, I don't think it would have as many benefits, but certainly for some women that's what they choose to do. You're not going to have unopposed estrogen and progesterone because you're not really making any estrogen. Although I would still want to make sure you weren't making some of your own estrogen from adipose tissue postmenopausally. And the very few handful of cases I've had in my career where I've had to compound progesterone, I almost routinely check an ultrasound every three to six months to make sure my patient's lining is not getting to the point where I need to consider a diagnosis or a workup of precancer or uterine cancer. So that is why I sincerely recommend FDA approved products. I promise for almost all of my patients, except for those that fit on one hand, I can really find a progestin that works for you. I have had a, also uh, the same number in my hand, the same amount of people actually undergo a hysterectomy because they could not tolerate progesterone. Now, that's a little extreme and certainly not something I recommend and is a very lengthy conversation and personal choice, um, but there are other ways that you can do this. One last medication that I didn't talk about is a medication called Juave, and Juave is conjugated equine estrogen and basidoxaphane, and that is another or different type of progesterone. There is also certainly a lot of other things that hopefully we're studying, so that there is more things in the repertoire that we have to fit exactly what a patient needs. For example, a more targeted type of progesterone would be really helpful, as well as maybe also, or we know actually in the, in the pipes, are some other non-hormonal agents that also might help with symptoms. So certainly it's a lengthy conversation. It really comes down to your safety and your personal decision and what fits your lifestyle the best. Whew, like all these videos, I always feel like I talk and talk and talk and it's not until I rewatch them that I'm pretty confident I hit all of the talking points. So I hope that I have at least broken down for you why to take a progesterone, who needs it, who doesn't, why to take it continuously versus cyclic, and just kind of discuss that there is lots of different options out there for you, especially those that are FDA approved. Wow, guys, thank you so much for watching my YouTube channel. Please go ahead and give this video a like and subscribe to my channel. If you've been watching for some time and you haven't yet hit that little special red button because it really helps other women see this podcast and it helps me know that you guys want to hear more of this content and I can make time to film it in this really hot room. So thank you to all of you for subscribing and following. Let me know your questions or comments. Comment below. What, how do you take your progesterone? Do you take it? Do you not? Um, what are your other remaining questions? Till next time, I'll see you guys next week.